Now for part two of psychological health. I just want to say at the beginning, and you've probably noticed it by now, but I've been using the word mental health and mental disorder and psychological health and psychological disorder interchangeably. We're going to look at different types of disorders, how to treat those disorders. We'll discuss what we'll be doing in class. The different types of psychological disorders we're going to look at are cognitive and anxiety disorders, as well as mood and psychotic disorders. Cognitive disorders are caused by by acute damage to or chronic degeneration of the brain. These disorders include dementia, the most common form of dementia, and the one that we'll be discussing is Alzheimer's disease. We'll also be discussing Parkinson's, and another cognitive disorder that we're not talking about is amnesia. In Alzheimer's disease, there is a problem with what are called nerve tangles and deposits in the brain cells. If we look on the left, if this is a nerve in the brain and this little tiny part are what are called neurofibrils. We're just going to look call them nerve fibers. What you can see is these are nice straight lines, nice straight fibers. However, in an Alzheimer's patient, the brain cells look like this. There are tangles, there are deposits of what are called amyloid plaques that causes a disruption in the fibers. And that leads to an inability of the brain to transmit those nerve impulses and to send those signals and neurotransmitters that we've been talking about. On the left is a normal brain. This controls language. This segment controls memory. In an Alzheimer's brain, due to the damage of these nerve fibers, there is a profound difference in the language and memory centers, leading to the changes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. There is no known cause, and as of right now, there is no cure. But there are new drugs. The FDA has currently approved five medications that may delay onset and temporarily relieve symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. In class, we'll look at this rather powerful and personal story as one man chronicles his father as he progresses and eventually dies from Alzheimer's disease. In Parkinson's disease, what occurs is a decline in the production of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Most cases have no specific cause. Some causes, however, may include head trauma, use of drugs, toxins, something called anoxia, or depriving the brain of oxygen for a long period of time. Without treatment, patients become rigid, they have problems with speech and motor skills, they have tremors. Perhaps you've watched Michael J. Fox, you've seen him on television. He has become a spokesman for Parkinson's disease. On the right, the book, The Case of the Frozen Addicts. It describes the story of how in 1982, suddenly in emergency rooms throughout the Los Angeles area, Young people were showing up, frozen. They were unable to move, and what they apparently all had in common was the use of a synthetic heroin. They're called frozen addicts because all of these tests were being done on them in the emergency room. They were being poked with needles. They were being prodded, looking for some type of response. There was none. And what is awful about Parkinson's disease is that while on the outside they appeared frozen, on the inside, they were able to feel everything. What resulted from this horrible tragedy, however, was the development of an animal model that allowed scientists and doctors to study how Parkinson's affects the brain. The Case of the Frozen Addicts, a phenomenal reading. Anxiety disorders occur in over 19 million Americans. Sometimes you may have what you may consider to be a panic attack. You have a rapid heart rate, shortness of breath, you may feel dizzy. It's not considered a disorder, especially if you're able to associate it with a specific event. However, when these panic attacks begin to occur without any apparent cause or reason, then your panic attack 
becomes a panic disorder. Anxiety is an emotional state that's characterized by feelings of nervousness or tension or a sense of apprehension. Phobias are considered anxiety disorders. An individual may be considered agoraphobic when they are afraid to be out in public or actually what it means is fear of developing an anxiety attack. What happens is over time these people won't leave their houses because they're afraid of becoming afraid. Claustrophobia is fear of being enclosed in places. This one is arachnophobia or fear of spiders. I put it in here because I have two sons, not small children anymore, who have an amazing fear of spiders. General anxiety disorder in which an individual experiences excessive worrying, excessive to the point where they are unable to perform any tasks of daily living and obsessive compulsive disorder. Perhaps you know of individuals with OCD. Perhaps you think you have certain obsessive compulsive type behaviors. Well, some of these behaviors include a need for perfection or symmetry, sorting or counting. The individual with this type of OCD is always making sure that things are in groups of five or groups of six, or sometimes they're just counting on their fingers. They need to make sure that they've counted up to a certain number before they're able to proceed with any other activity. They also have an obsessive belief in magical or superstitious thinking. This picture on the right, can't step on a crack in the sidewalk. They will avoid sidewalks in order to avoid the cracks. Individuals with OCD have obsessive rituals. They may be obsessed with washing their hands, with checking and rechecking locks or stoves or lights. In the movie As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson, we'll watch a clip of it in class that shows the behaviors that he exhibits that are a part of his obsessive compulsive disorder. The most common type of psychological disorder is also the most common type of mood disorder, which is depression. Is prolonged feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness along with periods of sadness. Now what I must tell you right now is that there's a difference between being depressed and experiencing depression. You certainly may have experiences in your life about which you are depressed, but when you are experiencing prolonged feelings of hopelessness and prolonged feelings of worthlessness, you may be developing a depression. An example may be viewing life through blue colored glasses as opposed to the optimist who views life through rose colored glasses. Mood disorders may be a combination of genetic and environmental factors and this goes back to what we talked about previously as the diathesis stress hypothesis that you may have a pre-existing genetic vulnerability and you then experience some type of stressful situation in your environment that triggers this mood disorder. Lack of motivation is a symptom of depression, not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to leave the house, not wanting to be involved in any activities that you used to like, like any hobbies, includes intense feelings of sadness or emptiness. Some people have talked about it as an indescribable feeling of heaviness. Women are more likely than men to be depressed, and it has been linked lower than normal levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin. Some of the medications that are used to treat depression are called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and this is because of the relationship between depression and this neurotransmitter. Dysthymia is a mild, chronic depression uh, lasting more than two years. A major depression is acute intense depressive state that is sustained for at least two weeks and bipolar disorder that used to be referred to as manic depressive disorder. We also have seasonal affective disorder. It's common around February and March in what are called temperate areas and yes we are living in a temperate area and it seems to be related to low exposure to sunlight. Some people respond to what's called phototherapy treatment where they sit for perhaps up to two and a half hours a day under this type of artificial light and that seems to help with their symptoms. And we have what are called psychotic disorders. These involve a total break from reality. It may be described as a disorder in which the personality is seriously disorganized 
and the person's contact with reality is impaired. Brief psychotic disorders usually last perhaps one day up to one month. They're usually associated with a traumatic event. Somebody experienced something unspeakable and their mind may be protecting them by causing this break with reality. Delusional disorders involve the presence of what are called non-bizarre delusions. The belief that something is occurring in the person's life that is really not out of the realm of possibility. Perhaps their partner is cheating on them or they believe they're being poisoned or followed. Something that could be possible but isn't really happening. And they continue to socialize and function normally uh, apart from this unfortunate delusion. Schizophrenia is the most extreme version of psychotic disorders and we're talking about bizarre delusions and hallucinations. Hallucinations include auditory and visual. Perhaps you've seen the movie A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. It was about a brilliant scientist named John Nash who suffers from schizophrenia. It's a complicated illness. It has multiple symptoms all portions of the brain are affected. The brain on the left has been diagnosed with schizophrenia and the brain on the right is from a healthy person. The schizophrenic's fluid-filled areas are much larger than the healthy brain and this leads to symptoms of schizophrenia. It's also thought that there may be an imbalance in the neurotransmitters produced in the brain. In class, I'm going to show you a short movie from, or a short clip from Second Life that is called Virtual Hallucinations, and we'll watch what an individual with schizophrenia might actually see and hear. This guy on the right, this Charlie Chapman mask, well, stay tuned. The thing about schizophrenia is it progressively worsens if left untreated, and it can sometimes be treated successfully. Here is a disorder in which individuals feel like they've got bugs crawling on them and they sometimes go to extremes to get rid of what they think may be crawling on them. They may pour kerosene on themselves, they may use agricultural pesticides to try to kill something that's not there. These individuals are usually treated with medications to try to calm them down. I'd like to take a moment to talk about suicide. As many as 90% of people who commit suicide are suffering from some type of psychological disorder. Therefore, most cases of suicide can be treated. Counseling and medication have been shown to be very effective, but sometimes, sometimes suicide happens with no apparent precipitating event or problem. There appears to be a suicide epidemic in our culture. It's the third leading cause of death in people aged 15 to 24. Suicide takes the lives of nearly 30,000 Americans every year. Over half of all suicides occur in adult men, and the rate has tripled over the last 50 years. Some of the signs of suicide risk include individuals threatening suicide or commenting frequently about death, increasing social withdrawal and isolation, getting away from people that they know and care about, an increase in high-risk behaviors, drinking, drugs, fast driving. Danger sign involves a sudden improvement in mood accompanying by behaviors like giving away prized possessions. A person may suddenly want to give away things that have been precious to them because they are no longer going to be around and they want somebody else to have this possession. Treatment and therapy can be very effective. The risk of suicide is reduced as soon as treatment is started. How are psychological disorders treated? There are a number of different therapies. Talk therapy is one of the more popular forms of treating psychological disorders. Other types of therapies include what's called cognitive therapy, where the focus is on helping people with the thoughts and attitudes that lead to disorders. I think of cognitive therapy as trying to recognize what is actually going on in their life that has led to the disorder and focusing on that. Behavior therapy focuses directly on changing problem behaviors. It's also referred to as a systematic desensitization involving real life exposure to fearful situations. I think of this as the person who is afraid of flying, like me, but we can talk about that later, as well as group family and couples counseling. Biomedical treatments are also very effective using 
medications or psychotropic drugs such as antidepressants, anti-anxiety meds, stimulants, and in severe cases, antipsychotic medications. Also, electroconvulsive therapy, previously known as shock therapy. It's a form of therapy for severe depression involving the administration of brief pulses of electricity to the patient's brain. It's not at all what you have seen in the movies and has been shown in many cases for many individuals to be extremely helpful. But you want not just medication, and in some cases, not just therapy. Medication will treat the symptoms of the illness. But therapy can help a person change the underlying patterns of thinking that lead to the feelings and behaviors of their illness. During class, we'll discuss the required assignments, videos, and podcasts that I've asked you to listen to and to watch. We'll watch some more short videos on specific disorders. You'll see what that Charlie Chapman head is about, as well as discussing the videos. And we'll also divide into groups, and I will hand out case studies in which you will be one of the psychological health professionals, either the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the social worker, or most likely the counselor. And I will give you different situations in which you will describe what condition you think the person is suffering from and how perhaps that person may be treated. Don't worry, you don't have to treat them. Thank you.